I'll be sharing a PPT. Yeah, yes, okay. So good morning to Professor Burbura sir and good morning to all the participants who are joining this course. Uh, on behalf of MMTTC, on behalf of all the participants of this course and on my personal behalf, I would like to welcome Professor S. Borbora, sir. He is presently Vice Chancellor of IKFAI University, Nagaland. And uh, he agreed for this session in this morning, despite his very, very busy schedule. So thank you, sir, for sparing time for us. Uh, sir, this is a program where some 34 teachers from different states have been registered. Uh, they are representing some 14 states, different states. And uh, mostly there are some 15 are from commerce background, some 10, 11 are from economics background and remaining are from management department. Sir. And uh, out of this, nearly 21 are PhD holders and remaining are pursuing PhD. And sir, this course is a 12 days course. As you know, sir, this is second last day. Tomorrow it is going to be finished. Uh, so, uh, dear participants, uh, you must be knowing him. He is a very known figure in the field of economics. He is a senior professor in IIT Guwahati. And now he is VC in uh, Ikfai University. Sir, now, and sir is going to talk about development debate, global and local. A uh, very important topic, uh, not only for economics, for commerce and management, for this field only. So, sir, now time is yours, sir. You may... You may start, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Singh. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh, although, although now in, I am into administration mostly, uh, but still I uh, like teaching and no, that is uh, my, uh, the 40, I can say that. No. So that is why uh, I thought that, okay, I am getting that opportunity after some time to teach, uh, at least to speak uh, to to young uh, faculty members of uh, different universities. And so that is why I take the opportunity and thank you uh, for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, we can start. Uh, I, I will be uh, sharing. Uh, yeah, this can you share. Uh, I, uh, I'll be having a PPT. Uh, my, uh, today's topic is development debates, global and local. <coughs> You see, uh, I, I found a very broad kind of a, a topic which is uh, mostly known by everybody because I've been told that you know, there are uh, the faculty members from uh, three disciplines, commerce, uh, business management, and economics. And uh, for each one of them, that, that, that some kind of understanding is already we have. Uh, so uh, th this is not nothing something new, but the, uh, there's a debate and these debates are still on. Because the, the, the process of development, whenever we talk of development, uh, uh, for whom develop? The, the, the first question comes that, no, naturally, uh, we are talking about the, uh, the human being. <laughs> for men and women. Because you know, whenever we talk the concept of development itself, you know, it is related to the uh, human development, also. But whenever looking at you from the subject wise, we can say that development can be thinking from the economic point of view, development can be thought of from social point of view, or development can be thought of from political point of view. And today, you see, initially, uh, although these three are the three viewpoints that we find are specific to its of the streams like something like economic, sociology, and political science. But still, you will find that development always intermingled with each other. Because without that, one other cannot. Because, say, as for example, in the political point of view, to what extent politically people are developed? Say, as for example, there, is a, there are different isms are there, and then their process of development will be different like communism, socialism, and capitalism. So, so from political point of view, the strategy for development will be different. In the same way that at what is the social point of view, how socially the human society are developed? To what extent our country is developed socially? 
because we have a lot of social obstacles are there. And in some countries, those obstacles may not may be very less. In some countries, those obstacles may be, uh, uh, may be much more. So th therefore, you will find that you no, know, that it may be the social I means it may be religious, it may be other social class strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so therefore, development can be viewed from different points of view. It may be from economic point of view, it may be from social point of view, it may be from uh, political point of view. But naturally, as an uh, the branch in economics, uh, as a student of economics, we'll be more emphasizing on economic point of view. Uh, is my voice is clear? Can anybody tell? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is uh, clear. Little echo is there, but uh, it is audible, sir. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, but, sir, this uh, your PPT is not in presentation mode. It's not full screen. And beginning... No, it is no, it is in a full screen from my side. Oh, but here we are seeing only that side panel and top menu also is visible. So it may be. Let, let me try again. Okay, okay, sir, sir. No, no, no. Next, no, no. From the beginning. No, no, so previous one, previous one, previous. Yeah, this is full screen now, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, maybe maybe the technical uh, yes. issues were here. Okay. Okay, so, so therefore, uh, what do you understand uh, development? It may be, you no, know, it may be understood from different point of view, but uh, uh, being a student of economics and mostly the... Uh, the participants are from uh, these three. Uh, we'll be mostly looking at from the economic point of view, not the social or other point of view, but all, all other views also ultimately influence each other. Because no, those, those things are also there in the process. Because we have seen that you know, how development happens and you know, how the politics uh, happen. You, know, you, you see that you now how the, the as for example, the Russia and Ukraine war. There's a political issues are here because of war, but no, that has an impact on economic development process. And not only it is affecting those two countries, it is affecting other countries also. In the same way, very recently, uh, there is the occupants in the in the neighbor in Bangladesh. You see that no, it has that that the political uh, that is the political aspects, but it has an uh, interlinked with the uh, with the economic aspects also. So, so therefore, one uh, it, it is not very exclusive as such. But the thing is that you know, our emphasis will be on economic point of view. So, so you see that you now that the concept of development was originally in a strict economic sense, and it was the rising per capita income. So, therefore. In the different phases of development, the GDP growth orientation and trickle down. So emphasis was on per capita income. And when the per capita income increases, and it will trickle down to everybody, everybody will get the, get the benefit. And that was since the World War, after the Second World War. That no, everybody thought that no, if the development happens, no, ultimately. Your GDP will uh, gross domestic product will increase. Your per capita, your income will uh, income will increase, and that will lead to per capita income increase increment, and that will have an uh, uh, impact on the development process. And everybody will get the benefit. But the thing is that we have seen that uh, that has not worked because that has not worked. We we have seen even today we see that inequalities are there. We cannot solely depend on no automatically in it will the per capita income will lead to the equality of to a certain extent of everything. So this is not happening. The trickle down has not happened. So so therefore, what has happened in, in the next phase broadly, uh, uh, you see that no direct effect on various issues. And mostly the developing countries will look the countries like India and other 
uh, the, the very much Asian countries, you will find that, no, there are a lot of emphasis on direct attack on these various issues, like poverty and inequality are different issues. And these poverty and inequalities are issues in the 70s, 80s, and even today, there is a poverty and inequality is issues in, the, uh, in these, uh, mostly in the developing countries. Yes, the poverty and inequality are there everywhere, in the developed countries also. But their poverty level, their inequality are in the difference because they have certain uh, things are placed, the social security, et cetera, et cetera, are in place to a certain extent. So everybody has a certain standard of living. But in the many developing countries, you will find that poverty and equalities are immense. The hardships are immense. So therefore, you will find that no, as because to overcome these, no, there is a direct attack on and poverty. If you look into India also, you will find that in 80s, we have the different uh, poverty alleviation program, like IRDP, Integrated Rural Development Program. And we have different policies, which leads to like taxation policies are progressive in nature. So what it does, it, it means that you know, it tries to uh, equalize to a certain extent. So that, that was one phase uh, when that you know, the emphasis has shifted from GDP growth orientation and trickled down to direct attack on poverty. So next you will find that now the next strategy is the globalization and development. Because many countries during those period of time, you will find that you no, know, they were trying to develop from within. As for example, if you look into the different policies at different point of time, you will find that. Say so for example, India, in the seventies, late seventies, eighties, we have an inward-looking policy. Inward looking policies mostly in the case of export import. That is, we are emphasizing that we should be self reliant. Even today, we, we told that now make it India. But make it India has to be competitive. But during those, those periods of time, it was not competitive. You provide some facilities. There are arguments like infant in the industry arguments. That no, in fact, because now, like infants, you have to cut in them. You have to provide the facilities to them so that you no, know, they can uh, grow easily. But there is a certain cost. It cannot be competitive in age. So in the 70s, 80s, we have a very inward looking policies where we mostly are talking about the self-reliance and we are talking about industrialization. But the, but the thing is that no, whether we well, most of the developing countries could develop or not. Because we have the different theories, which is back in international theory, you see that no, we have the <coughs> absolute advantage, competitive advantage, and those kind of theories are there. And the theories say that that somebody is specialized in certain areas and they should specialize and they should export. So, so if there is an uh, import ex export and uh, there is a relationship between the countries, ultimately all the countries can develop. So those kind of uh, the thinking were there and it has developed over the years, theoretically also. And today we <coughs> have to accept that no, we are living in a global village and so globalization is going to stay. And, and along with the globalizations, we will find that the development has to take place. And no country, no, no. Slowly. Yeah. No, no country uh, can be on their own. They have to be reliant on others. And that is why, that is the globalization. We are depending on each other. It's not that the developed countries are, are also to a certain extent depending on the developing countries because they need a market. Let's for example, India. India is a big market. 
That is why you will find that the MNC and others are here. We have certain advantages today, especially in the human resources. So therefore, they also want to develop by using our resources. So therefore, the globalization and the concept of global, globalization and development has come. So you see that the you know, changes are happening over the years. That how the development, and that is the debate. So debate is that you know, whether trickle down is has to be there, whether uh, there should be a direct act of poverty or there should be globalization and development. And in that process, you see, even today, as for example, in if you take the example of India, because it is easier for all of us to grasp the India's uh, example, because everybody knows. Because although we are in, a, in the midst of globalization today, but still we have not excluded the direct attack on poverty and inequality. There are a lot of a uh, lot of schemes, a lot of uh, development uh, strategies to overcome the poverty even today because you know, these are in existence. There are a lot of people, maybe uh, maybe 50-20% people are below the poverty line who do not have a two square meals a day. We have the problem of inequality even today. We have not overcome this. So you will find that there is a mixture of the different strategies are happening today. So over time, it is recognized that numerous social, political, geographical, historical, cultural, psychological, and environmental determinants affect the nation's prospect. So the, even the concept of development and change, you see that initially we have the GNP growth orientation, then after that, whenever we talk about the development, we talk about the human development. <clears throat> Then broadly, after that, what has happened? That after human development, now we are talking about the sustainable development. So what is the sustainable development? Everybody knows that we have to always think about the future. The future is also always uh, quite important. We have to keep something for the, our next generations. In the because you no, know, these are becoming uh, very important. That is why I'm saying that the historical, cultural, psychological, and environmental determinants affects nations' pros uh, <clears throat> nation prospects for successful development. Because today we have already seen that you no know, on the impact of climate change, global warming, and these are not these are not country specific or region specific. This kind of problem will impact all the countries. Whether it is a developing country or developed countries. So therefore, in this, what approaches of development has to be the global approach. Climate change, if India takes some decisions or X, Y, Z, any other of the countries are taking some decisions, that will not help. It is a, the collective decision has to be taken. And, and that is why there are a lot of emphasis on today on environment. And that is why it is related to sustainable development. You see that, no, that is why I'm saying that in the process of development, we cannot, although we are emphasizing economics, we cannot, other factors, the historical, cultural, and everything. Because many of the things that we inherited from the past, they give us a lot of thought process, a lot of uh, way how to develop. Because no, that sustainable development, the development always, no, there is a two side, how to develop. So we have to have, we have to keep the nature in place. Without damaging the nature, without damaging things, how we can develop. So that is that is what the sustainable development. But usually, whenever we talk about development, it's mostly studied from economic point of view, which I have already told you that. Where technical examination of how to mobilize resources most effectively and build infrastructure based with it. 
but new institutional rules of governance are not emphasized. Because, because you see, the, in, in the process of development, we are destroying the environment, especially in the <coughs> developing countries, because we do not have the, the capital as well as the resources as well as the, the technology. So therefore, you see that now that, that is why uh, the developing countries are uh, far behind from the developed countries because developing countries are more resourceful, whether it is technology, whether it is the capital, which are lacking in the developing countries. So their way of development is different than our way of development. So, so, so therefore, what is necessary that we have to incorporate the newer institutions, newer institutions to uphold the environmental impact. So therefore, nowadays you will find in developing countries like India also, you have to have a, the big projects. So you have to have an environmental clearance. So it is slowly these things are changing in the, so the strategy of development is changing. So that is the debate, whether we should, we should have the previously whatever we have or whether we should follow some new strategy. Because the concept of development itself is changing. So development is a question of human values, attitudes, goals self-defined by societies, and criteria for determining what is the tolerable cost to be borne by whom in the course of change. Because development is a change. It will change from worse to better, better to best. But the thing is that now what kind of development? Who will decide now what is to be developed and what, in what way it is to be developed? So it depends on human values. Because different societies, approach of development will be different. It depends on the societies. Ultimately, it is the society. It says for India's development, it is society in India, how we can influence the development process and how we want to develop. So there are, <coughs> there's a cost. So a road is built, something has to be cut down. To what extent we have to cut down, how we can minimize the en environmental degradation. Those kind of things, there is a cost. Because we can do it by cutting everything, by destroying the environment. But ultimately that will impact on the climate. And that will be affected, not only the present generation, but that will affect the, the future generations also. So therefore, that is the debate, that how the development has to happen. Because ultimately it is the societies at different point of time, they need to decide what they want and how they want to have those. And what they want to forego today in order to develop. So those are the questions, those are the debates in the minds that you know, how develop. And that is why I'm saying that it is a development debate. And the debates are still on. Things. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Development is a is an ambiguous adventure. Born of tensions between what goals are sought, for whom and how these are obtained. Innovations create strains between new demands for information, material goods, services, freedom and effective capacity of societies to meet these new demands. So you see, <clears throat> the development is there. It is a, it's, it's being told as an adventure. What goods are to be served? Because no, you see that no, <clears throat> we need more and more. It's for example, the, the kind of technology we are using Today, for example, this. 
Zooming and no, everybody is in different places. Uh, uh, we, we are talking to each other. This is one technology, internet, WhatsApp, no, email, all these kind of things, the technology. <clears throat> so you, you see, these were not there previously. And mostly in India, what has happened? <coughs> that these things are becoming popular only in the, a few years ago. It was there, but we are not using it as we are using it today. Mostly because of the tensions, because of the tensions like during the COVID period. During the COVID, everything was closed up. So how to interact, how to take classes and all, no. So there is a technology is there, we can use it. And after that, you will find that mostly these online meetings, online hybrid model, these, that, and all these things have come up. So this is helping in the development. To a certain extent, it is helping in, uh, in various ways. Now today, it's something like uh, knowledge dissemination. Because of the internet, you will find that nowadays everything is possible sitting in the in your home, in your office. So therefore, you will find that what is necessary that now how these are obtained, then how we can use it. So this is this is because because the innovations. So somebody is creating invention and innovations are very important. So ultimately that is that, that kind of demand can be made. You will find that no, now it is previously, uh, we do the marketing right? by going to a shop. You have to buy across the counter. Whether it is vegetable, whether it is uh, eatables, or whether it is other things. But today, because of the technology, what is happening that you can buy while sitting in your home? <laughs> E-commerce. <coughs> you see that. No. So those are the, also the process of development, process of innovation, the tensions that has been created. So this has an impact on development. Because nowadays you don't have to go to the place. You can get anything uh, to your home through the e-commerce methods. And not only that, you see that what, what the development has happened. That along with that, there is the changes in the financial system. Because e-commerce, you have to question how do you pay? You are going physically across the counter, you can pay. So, so therefore, you have to pay <laughs> to the banking channels. Nowadays, we have so many channels. Internet payments may be there. Through internet, you can pay. Through UPI, you can pay. Through credit card, you can pay. Through debit card, you can pay. So previously, there's the banking was 9 to 4 kind of a, 9 to 2 kind of a uh, uh, period for banking. But today, the banking is 24 by 7. We do not have to go to the bank. Everything can be done online or at most if you need some cash, you can get it from the ATMs. So that is the, you see that that is the kind of development ultimately which will have an impact on various strategies of development. So some kind of innovations and you know, inventions and all the, how we utilize the technology. And ultimately, it has an impact on development. And if you look into for us nowadays, that's because they are using it, we do not think very much about this. But the thing is that no, <coughs> so it has started at a certain point of time, changes has happened. And this has put into practice that over the years, no, yeah, popularities has come down. Very recently, I have seen that no, the number of ATMs has come down. They have reduced the ATM because people are using mostly the UPI. Google Pay, Phone Pay, whatever maybe. <clears throat> so, so you see that now what 
what kind of development we want in different sectors of the economy. So ethical judgments as to good life, just society, <clears throat> and quality of relations of people among themselves and with nature always serve as an operational criteria for development planners and resources. <clears throat> so what is good life? So you have to maintain a certain standard of living. And how to get those standards of living? And whenever I am talking about it is a standard of living for the society as a whole. What kind of society we have? To a certain extent, they should be on some kind of evaluation, whether we have a just society or not, or whether there are skill development uh, need to take place. The, what quality of relations are am, uh, am, among themselves in the people in the society? And the, how nature always serves as the operational criteria? Because the changes are happening. So you see that climate change, I have already told you that, that is why we are talking. Climate change has an impact on agriculture. There are a lot of studies on these things because the climate change will have an impact on the, the, the pattern of rain and floods, etc. etc. You see that you know, all these <laughs> has an impact on the operational criteria for development. So we have to change. The, the criteria of development. Maybe, maybe we have to have certain kind of business, for example, in agriculture, we have to have certain kinds of agriculture, which is uh, uh, more, uh, we, we can we tell the climatic changes. So, so therefore you find that you no, know, for development planners and the researchers, this is a operational criteria need to change. That's for example, I'm giving the example of uh, agriculture. Agriculture needs to change and it has to plan with those things. So value con con conflicts always the good life foundation of just society adopted and <coughs> adopted towards the nature. You see that no, always they are. <coughs> So for good life, we need something at the same time, you will find that what kind of criteria will be adopted and that will has to be, uh, 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 has an impact uh, towards uh, the nature. Because nature always needs to be taken care of in the process of development. Because, because in, the, uh, in the aftermath of World War II, the most of the countries has not given emphasis on the nature, the environment. And therefore you will find that we could see now the, the kind of problems we have, especially in relation to climate variation, climate change. <coughs> the global warming is uh, increasing. No, the nature of uh, the, as for example, the nature of your rain and Etc. are changing. Even in India, we could see. It. So this has an impact on agriculture. It, and so ultimately, we, it will have an impact on the development process. So there, therefore, there is a debate that whether we should go with the nature or we should respect nature. And therefore, next. <coughs> so, so therefore, now it is, you will find, initially I have already told you that, <clears throat> that or per capita income, <clears throat> GNP growth, then human development, then sustainable development. <clears throat> but today we are talking about the sustainable development. <clears throat> the achievement of sustainable and equitable development remains a great challenge facing human race. And that is a fact. Even today, <laughs> that is a challenge. Because we want to accelerate development and when the process of development, we want to destroy the environment. And if the environment is <laughs> destroyed, it will not, will not have a sustainable development. 
because the future will be affected. And it is also evident equitable development has not been achieved. This <coughs> achieved disparities are widening, and new poverty is being produced faster than the new wealth by economic growth. So even in India, you see that economic Inequalities are increasing. Yes, to a certain extent, standard of living is increasing, the per capita income is increasing, but the difference is huge between the haves and have nots. And it is not only in India, in many of the developing countries. Because we are not following. <laughs> the sustainable development path. So each country is blaming each other. Developing countries may be blame uh, the developed countries. Developing countries are insisting on developing countries. They have to maintain so much of forest, this, that. Now it is the question of carbon credit and all. <coughs> so everybody, all of us, <laughs> know about the sustainable development. There's a development that meets <coughs> the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their needs. We cannot, we can, we cannot, we should not destroy everything today so that we do not have let anything for the future generation. So Paul Skitin. She has told that sustainable development is more complex as it has at least six different meanings. What it is? It can signify the maintenance, replacement, and growth of capital assets, both physical and human. What is that maintenance, replacement, and growth of capital assets? Because whenever the capital assets are there, there will be depreciation. So at a certain point of time, you have to maintain, and not only that, no, you have to replace it. And there has to be an incremental capital growth. And they are talking about most, mostly from physical and human. Physical, yes, the machine technology and everything will change and you have to maintain that. At the same time, what is happening that now you have to develop the human because the skills required are changing. Previously, as for example, teaching. <coughs> so it is a talk and shop kind of a teaching. You go to the classroom, write something in the blackboard, you discuss with your uh, students and that, that is a kind of teaching. But today it's not. So you have to use technology. In order to and then the, use the technology, you have to <coughs> know how to use the technology. <coughs> when I have done my PhD, the late eighties, getting the degree in the beginning of 90s, we do not have the, uh, the facility or uh, you can say that of the computers. So whenever you are doing anything like coordination, regression, all no very uh, nominal kind of a <coughs> variables you can take because if you large number of data, how how can you compete manually? But today you don't have. If a time series data and all because everything is now you can do it computer. Their softwares are there. So you see that we have to adjust the changes. So human being also need to develop. So new technology will be coming, you have to adapt to the new technology. Whether it is young or old doesn't matter. So everybody needs to adapt the new technology, that is very important. <laughs> At least up to a certain limit. <laughs> okay? Number two, out of six, maintaining the physical environment conditions for the constituents of well-being. 
maintaining the physical environment conditions. You have to create an environment. For those people to work in cohesion. So the, 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 there has to be a process. <clears throat> you have to create a, that physical environment. As for example, you need computers and all, no, all those kind of environment you have to create. So that, uh, that, no, that both the physical and human development can happen. The resilience of a system enabling to adjust to shocks and crises. <laughs> so that is also the necessary resilience of a system. You have the capacity, capability to adjust to the shocks and crises. Fourthly, avoiding burdening the future generations with <laughs> internal and external needs. So that, that is one, because mostly you will find the developing countries. They have to depend on this. They have to take from <coughs> not only internally, but externally also. Many of the countries, you will find there is a debt there's a problem, there's the balance of payments problem channel. But the thing is that there is a necessity to, because if you go on taking debts, Ultimately, that will impact on the future generations. Because everybody has that, like an individual, every, every country also will have a certain capacity to take dates. So various countries, that is why they need to have a problem of balance of payment. And it was happening uh, in the 80s, 90s. Even today, some of the countries are having lots of problems, like Sri Lanka has. Now, Maldives has. Now, Pakistan has. No, like in, even the, the, the Bangladesh is uh, having some negotiation with IMF and uh, even Pakistan is having that. So, therefore, <coughs> there's a necessity to, in order to have sustainable development, avoiding burdening the future generations with internal and external needs. Fiscal adversity and political sustainability. A policy must be credible and acceptable to citizens so that there is a sufficient consent to carry it out. <clears throat> the efficiency in all this, in the fiscal points, in the adversity points. So, because no, the, the justice and the corruption should be less. Justice should be there. The fiscal efficiency has to be there. Whether the taxation policies, whether <coughs> taxation are implemented properly or now it is because <coughs> because of the, the internet and all everything is linked with uh, say for example India we have mostly the the banks are linked with your banker and the <coughs> other card and all that. so everything is known so what is your income it's not known by the different. Uh, government departments like income tax, etc. So you see that no, that, that, that is a requirement. Fiscal and political sustainability. That, that the stability is always very important. Whenever there is the instability, political instability is there, development always suffers. So therefore, the fiscal adversity and political sustainability. Sustainability means that mostly the stability. You cannot change now and then. There has to be stability in the policy. A policy must be credible. That is, because ultimately we are talking today, if you uh, look back now, we are <coughs> talking about the globalization of the If the policy changes frequently, uh, there will not be any investment in your country. So, because the many of the developing countries are now depending on FDI, because your internal investments are, your savings and investments are maybe less. So if you attract foreign direct investments, foreign rental capital, etc. No, it is coming to the stock market and all. No? So depending on the policy, depending on the all these fiscal, administrative and political sustainability, 
you will find that you know, A can be may develop. Sixthly, it is the, the, the ability to hand over the projects to the management by citizens of the developing country in which they are carried out. So that the foreign experts can withdraw and jeopardizing their success. <clears throat> so ultimately, in many of the developing countries, what? That they have to depend on technology and capital <clears throat> from, from foreign countries. Because many of the developing countries do not, they do not have a technology. But the thing the projects are, when projects are developed, they have to run the projects. And therefore, the human resources need to adjust to the new situation and they have to do it. At a certain moment of time, still I remember that when in the 60s, uh, many of the many of the refineries has come up. The pipeline has to be created and on no for petroleum products. You'll find that mostly it is the foreigners, foreign concerns, and only the day to the pipelines and all. Because we did not have the technology that time. But today we have the technology, we have already expertise it. We have internalized it. So therefore, you'll find that no, those kind of things has to happen for sustainability. Always you cannot depend on. Foreign experts. You have to, you have to grow those kind of uh, <coughs> improvement and uh, the workmanship there. Because otherwise, if you do not do that, if the experts go back, so that will have an impact on the success of the project. Always, we cannot depend on. So you have to make yourself confident so that you know we can operate successfully. So whether they next, <clears throat> therefore, whether sustainability development are compatible in itself is a, a disputed question. No consensus exists as to how development can be rendered sustainable, and no consensus exists as to what strategies are best suited to achieve development. So therefore, those are the debates. The economists. Keith Griffin has evaluated six development strategies pursued before the advent globalization, moni monetarism, open economy, industrialization, green revolution, redistribution, and socialism. <laughs> His empirical results yielded by these strategies different in different countries are. <laughs> what are these? These are the strategies he has told about the these are the resource mobilization and income. So you see that the, these are related with each other. You need to have resources. In the development process, you need to invest. So in, in investments, you have to have resources. First, resources will <laughs> depend on income level. So for example, we have the income. The broadly you see that why is the income C plus S consumption and savings and savings is converted to R. Savings is equal to you can say that <laughs> if there is an institutional savings are there, uh, that that will be related to. So <clears throat> income level is very important. So savings has that. That is why savings has that. Second is the saving investment and growth. When, whenever there is a saving, there is a possibility that there will be investment and investment naturally will lead to the growth. And the growth required what is, what is necessary that human capital formation. Okay, because what is necessary? The technology will change. With the technology, we have to <laughs> enhance your Efficiency by means of internalizing what kind of technology, how can you use it. Just for example, no, I have not used computers before when in my student life and all. I've already told you that no, 90s we do not have the computers in India for us. 
part as a student and all. I've seen it, no, like the, the dot means mis it has come, but very rarely used. I, uh, I, I, I have done my uh, PhD thesis in a computer and the printing was no, there is no laser printer or anything. It was a dot matrix printer. So that kind of game. But today we have no so very <coughs> upward kind of a, uh, the printers are there. <coughs> so human capital formation with the changes we need to change. We have to adapt to the changes, which we have already told previous theories. Next. Next is the poverty and inequality. You see that this, this is very important in the development process. Because the inequalities are there and there are poverty. And mostly we'll find these are more, more prominent in the developing countries. The inequalities, inequalities, <coughs> the huge inequalities, and over the years in the development process, you see that inequalities have increased. Poverty to a certain extent decreased, but still poverty is prevalent. And there's the role of the state. And role of the state, you see that, no, that is why in the different systems, different is it, the role of the state will be different. In socialism, communism, you will find that there's the public sector has a role to play. But in a, in a uh, capitalist, the public sector has very minimal role to play. All the mixed economy where there is a role played by both the public and the private. So the role of the state is are there in mostly in most of the developing countries because the, the existence of uh, those kind of things like the poverty inequality as well as the the problem of resource mobilization, savings, and human capital formations. Because we cannot leave everything to the private sector. For example, how many of us would be able to go to a school, college, or university if it is everything is only, only in the private sector? Because mostly we are we have done in the public sector. No, I've gone to high school, government high school. I've gone to a uh, public college. I've gone to a public university, mostly in India. How many can afford? Yeah, now, now it is that is happening in India. It's, no, it's happening. Now even the foreign universities are coming. Even the private universities has come up. You may have heard about the Osaka University. We look into the cost of studying in Osaka University and a public university, whether it is Mizoram University or Guwahati University or Calcutta University or Osmania University or whatever. So yeah, the, it is a cost difference. Everybody cannot. But because you know, that, that is the role of the state is there in, in education, in health. Yes, now it is a lot of <laughs> private health facilities are there. But how many people will be able to afford that? So therefore, the role of the state is, and whenever the role of the state is there, you will find that no, the role of the state in is everywhere. That, that is, that the resource mobilization is also there through the taxation policy, through the banking sector, that you know, savings and investment, and in creating human resources. So, role of the state are there everywhere, and the participation, democracy, and freedom. This is very important. <laughs> in order to develop for the betterment of the society, for betterment of the ma masses, that, that is why the political development or social developments are also quite important. That is why I'm saying that we are emphasizing more on economic development, but others who are also very important. There has to changes. We have to adapt politically and socially also. <laughs> Otherwise, Uh, it is very difficult. The results are indecisive, and he concluded that there, there is no base path to develop. Because <laughs> all these things are necessary, but this is not happening as it should happen. Just so for example, in India, I, I, I think in many of the states in India are socially still less developed. There is a disparities are. How we see the social hierarchy of different sections, for example, male and female in different societies. <laughs> but 
but grows increasingly clear that regardless of development path or strategy, sustainability must be ensured in five domains. And these domains are economic, political, social, environment, and cultural. You see that here, all <coughs> these are only one in one aspect is economic. But other aspects are also very important. Today we are talking about that is where the cultural richness. Because in the development process, human to human, man to man, so these are very important, the kind of relations. Because a country, <laughs> relations with others, it, it may be from the people to people relations. Long term economic viability depends on the use of resources that <laughs> does not deplete them irreversibly. Next. I'll take maybe another 10 minutes and then the rest will be here. Political viability rests on creating all uh, for all members of society a stake in its survival. This cannot be achieved unless all enjoy freedom. No, no, no. You have gone to. Yeah, this one. <clears throat> unless enjoy freedom in viable personal rights and believe in the political system within which they pursue some common good and most, uh, and not the mere uh, particular interest. And what then with the sustainability requires the maintenance of the abundant diversity of life forms and biosystem, a restorative mode of resource use and disposable waste within the nature's absorptive limits. In development is to be socially and culturally sustainable. The foundations of community and symbolic meaning system must be protected. Next. <laughs> Providing satisfactory conception, institutional and behavioral answers to these three value creations, the good life, the society, and the sound relation to nature is what constitutes development. You see that the concept of development is changing. That no, how? It follows that not every nation with high per capita income is truly developed. And that only authentic development ought to be sustained. For example, when human development <coughs> concept has come, Sri Lanka was at a certain point of time, they were far better in human development compared to many of the countries like India. So, <coughs> so what constitutes a development? So, therefore, the good life, just society and sound relations to nature. So, these are the, 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 the that is uh, concerning the sustainable development. Now, what is authentic human development? Economic growth and human development is the aim. Economic growth is the means, and the human development is the aim. Because ultimately, whenever we, I have already told you that, so whenever we talk about development, is related to human development. <clears throat> if things go wrong. It leads to distorted development and to excessive cost of human sufferings and cultural destructions. In, in a workshop on ethical uh, issues in development in 1986 in Colombo, and consensus was reached. Next. that any defi uh, uh, adequate definition of development must include the following dimensions. What are these? An economic component dealing with creation of wealth and improved conditions of material life uh, equally distributed. A social ingredient measured as well as, uh, as, as, well as being, uh, well-being of health, education, housing, and employment. A political dimension embracing such, such values as human rights, political freedom, legal enfranchisement of persons, and some form of democracy. A cultural element in recognition of fact that cultures confer identity and self worth to people. Full life paradigm, which refers to the meaning, system, symbols, and the belief concerning the ultimate meaning of life and history. So you see that no, these are the ethos 
or ethos of development. So, so whenever we talk about development, we are not talking about only economic development, but it can embrace the whole lot of things. These are the ethical issues of the development. And you can see that now whether we are following this, whether we, can, we have achieved this. If not, how to achieve that? So that is, that is, that is the, that kind of uh, thinking has to be there. Next. <laughs> A sound development strategy is that will be oriented towards forms of economic growth whose production package centers are around basic needs, job creation, decentralized public infrastructure investment, aimed at producing multiple modes of development, adequate allocation of ration of public expenditure devoted to human priority concerns, and incentive policy to favor increased productivity to in low productive sectors and selective linkage and delinkage with global markets with primary emphasis on domestic markets. So that, that is the suggestion. So these, these, this kind of a policy is ultimately is required in the process of that. Next. <clears throat> Development debate in the age of globalization. Globalization extends its reach into diverse realms: economic, finance, culture, technology, information and governance. The results of globalization are mixed. Previously unmanaged, unimagined advances have been secured in numerous domains. Wealth has been created, technology has been diffused, political <coughs> solidarities around issues of human rights, women's equality, the defense of indigenous cultural communities and ecological health has been consolidated. But ex exerted high, a high prices in the form of new and large inequalities, the, the dilution of effective national sovereignty and multiple insecurities. Among the threats to human security arising from globalization, the, U Next. the UNDP list, these are economic insecurity, job and income security, health insecurity, cultural insecurity, personal insecurity, environmental insecurity, and political and community insecurity. This highly visible nature of threats has given rise to criticisms. The key dignity, Key disagreement centers in on four issues. And what are these four issues? Next. <laughs> Should free trade and maximum integration into global competitive markets be promoted or selective integration around locally, regionally, nationally, transregionally specific forms of indigenous development is to be sought? So that is the debate that you know, whether you should have a uh, integrations with the global economy or in a different pattern. Widening economic, financial, and technological integrations into competitive global markets has adversely affected not only the countries that have been direct victims of financial collapse, but several developed countries as well, notably India, enabled to create remunerative employment and to provide governmental welfare services at the acceptable level. These are, these are some of the, the, the debates or the, the questions in the mind. Should rapid and high level of economic growth continue to be pursued on the assumption that it is necessary for development? Or should growth be rest, restrained or qual, uh, qualitatively either in order to ensure environmental and social sustainability over a long time? Whether so what form of whether it's sustainable development, whether it is a GNP growth orientation or trickle down effect, what kind of development? Should investment in resource transfer strategies be guided by global macroeconomic concerns, or should more alternative bottoms up development be pursued? In recognition, these must be confined to macro arenas, but also the macro arenas. Should internationally operating business corporations be viewed as a main asset of or institutional actor in development with, with, with government, civil society organization, or international financial institutions? The ABO core provide us the contours on contents of development debates. 
In the present era of globalization, they may be put in the simple equations as below. Next. So these are these are the uh, some of the questions that if uh, is globalization good for development? If so, how much globalization operating under what rules of governance and what pursuit of what ends? What kind of development does globalization on the present model generate elitist dependency inducing, culturally destructive? socially disruptive, uh, personally alienating, and environmentally damaging development. Or conversely, is globalization development that is participatory, emancipating and liberating from many, for the many, serving as a dynamic catalyst of regenerated cultural visibilities, conducive to social cooperation and environmentally sound for the long run. Okay. So it is the, I, I think this is the last slide. A coherent answers to these questions is, is still elusive. We have a mixed bag of different macro and microeconomic and other facets of development. What is immensely important here that with sound policies and programs and effective governance to deliver the results, the result oriented output is a must where we need to debate a lot so as to achieve human development and not development per se, as we encountered in today's world. This is applicable whether we perceive development globally or locally. Thank you. Uh, this is my presentation at the top. And at the same time, uh, I would like to Request all the participants here, if you have not uh, gone through a lecture by John Antonio Ocampo, who was a Colombian economist, uh, he was a minister also. He talked in, with the Antar. Uh, uh, his lecture is known as the Development Debates in Historical Perspective. It is available in the internet, or maybe I will be sharing with uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, which he can circulate. So you can go through these uh, uh, development uh, debates also, which will give you such a more uh, in-depth uh, analytical uh, viewpoint on the de development debates. Because the development is happening, but there are still a lot of questions, and that is why it is known as a development debate. And how to develop, whether it is to be globalized or whether it should be uh, located. So those kind of, no, locally means internally, to what extent we should be globalized and all, you know. Now it is because, therefore, you'll find that in many developed countries also is coming up with a lot of strategies. Like, no, like uh, today, you know that, no, my American elect president, Trump, he was taking that, no, I'll be using the tariffs very in order to oh, <laughs> look into that, you know, how American economy can get the benefit through trade. So those kind of things, and this can be, these are the different kinds of talks that is happening. Yeah, that is all from my side. Uh, if anybody has any uh, anything to observations and all, uh, you are always welcome. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, interesting talk on a very pertinent topic. Sir, uh, there are four questions uh, posted by our audience, our participants. Yeah. So should I read it yeah. one by one, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, first question is from Adi Vepa. And he's asking, uh, sir, does Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Palestine, Iran and USA interference affect the economy of the world? And how does it affect Indian economy? I have not got into that all this, but naturally we see that now. Now, now in a globalized atmosphere, you see that Russia and uh, Ukraine war, all, all this kind of war, anything. So number one thing that now to what extent <laughs> because many of the developing countries, even India, we are depending on we are oil importing countries. To what extent it has an impact on the prices of oil? 
because of the Middle East problem will have an impact on price. Because no, there are restrictions on the on 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 Russia. But yes, no, to a certain extent, India has although uh, importing uh, oil from uh, Russia uh, in an advantageous situation. But no, there are issues are there globally that no, there are restrictions in, in, in importing from Russia, the kind of uh, <laughs> the trade Russia can have. Then, then many of the products which are being imported from Ukraine also to a great extent, these are suffered by many of the countries and India also to that extent, they do those kind of the war. So as for example, you see that you know, there are a lot of students has gone to uh, Ukraine to study medicine. You see that what is the plight of that, those students? So it has, you no. Know, it, it is not only that economically that no Indian students have been affected. Ultimately, they have no mostly many of them have shifted to some other countries also. So impact will be there naturally. Impact will be there very very recently. Yesterday, the the Syrian uh, I, I think uh, the, the Syria has no uh, Damascus has been by the 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 opposition. No, like <clears throat> it is taken over. So those kind of things are happening and naturally whenever there is instability, it will have an impact on development. So and because the, the, the policies are there, the, 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 the policies are there that each country is helping each other and all. No, as for example, no, you do not think about only Russia and Ukraine, but you think about say Bangladesh and India. What is that? The, there is instability in Bangladesh, no, because say Kasina has been thrown out. Then uh, now interim government is there. Now what is the impact on the economy? Yesterday I have seen that no, uh, like some internet uh, agreements where they are these are uh, discarded. No, it might have an impact on internet uh, connectivity. It, it is agreement through Airtel and all. No, it might have an impact on internet activity in the north region because many of the things are happening through uh, Bangladesh. So the, 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 the kind of things are uh, happening in uh, Bangladesh, it might have an impact. So in the same way, we will find that different countries have different impact from uh, the war situations. Whether it is the Russia, Ukraine, and India has also has a lot of imports from uh, Ukraine, which are being affected now. They have to resource it from another country, maybe, because of the situations. So any instability will have an impact on the process of development. And because in a, in a global atmosphere, naturally, in a varying circumstances, it will have an impact. Okay. Sir, next question is from... Is it okay? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, sir, second question is from Dr. Amit Kumar Tiwari. And he's asking, is there... Uh, uh, there is a contradiction between employment generation and faster economic growth. Then what strategy should India adopt? What, what is the question? Can you repeat it uh, again? Yes, yeah, yeah. so there is a contradiction between employment generation and faster economic growth. Yeah. So what India should do? So you see that it depends on the kind of strategy. <clears throat> Mostly now what is happening that it is a technology late growth in India. So what is happening that now what say broadly if you look into uh, the different sectors of the economy, primary, secondary, and tertiary, you'll find that tertiary sector is contributing more to that. That is, the services sector are contributing more to the uh, GDP. And you see that the employment generations in the tertiary sectors are also comparatively more. But the thing is that, no, these are technology driven. They cannot. No, only the, the, the top level human resources can be employed in those sectors. That's for example, the software development, et cetera, et cetera, banking development. Now it is the banks are also run through the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the process of uh, technology because everything is done through computers and all, all these things. So, so therefore, everywhere you need the good quality human resources. But to what extent we have the efficiency in the human resource development? Because there are a lot of studies. If you see that, no, there are uh, maybe we are producing more than one lakh uh, engineers in a year, more than. But the thing is that no, there are studies we say that only 20, 25 percent of them are employable. That is, without training, they cannot be employed. So there is a there is a cost of employment. So so therefore, you, you see that what is necessary that 
we have to make our resources more employable, number one. Then, then secondly, you see that, no, <laughs> by means of education, many a time we find that, no, we are looking only for the white color child. And then many a time, so we, 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 well, we do not fall back on other kind of activities. Thirdly, what is required in, uh, in a developing country like, like India is that the entrepreneurship development. Instead of becoming an employee, you should create employment orientation. So there is a lot of scope for entrepreneurship and there are a lot of emphasis that are also being given. But the thing is that no, this has to be channelized properly and implemented properly. There are policies are there. So, but the thing is that to what extent it is again? Yeah, because no, there are a lot of studies as for example, I know that on uh, entrepreneurship, you, you see that entrepreneurship only by means of providing some subsidies, etc. you cannot develop. But you have to create a climate for entrepreneurship. So those kind of climate, as for example, that is why uh, something is called that, <clears throat> that now what is the efficiency in uh, getting an uh, uh, entrepreneurship set up. So, so you find that there, there are a lot of studies we say that, no, therefore, strategy has to be, so naturally, number one, that employable kind of orientation in education, which is very much required. And how it is to be implemented, it is a challenge. Like NEP 2020 is talking about all these things, but to what extent it will be successful because you no know, different states and all, because India being a vast country, so those kind of facilities may not be there for a long time, but it will take time and it will uh, have to happen. So that has to, we have to, the quality has to be upgraded. Then absorptive capacity of the people need to be upgraded so that you no know, they 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 become the more and more skillful and you no know, they, they can be employable and there's a necessary to enhance entrepreneurship so that you no know, uh, people uh, can become more productive and they can uh, provide more employment opportunity in different parts of the country so that is the strategy has to be changed we cannot we cannot depend on only capital intensive uh, kind of a uh, <coughs> production but it has to be, you no, know, there is a diversification has to be there. As for example, in agriculture, there can be a diversification. So agriculture, because climate change, I have already told you that, you no, know, there is a need for the diversification. Those kind of diversification, you no, know, high value kind of a, uh, the production uh, activities that need to be there. Yeah, and so in the, especially in the horticulture sector, in the floriculture sector, these, these things are happening. Because people came to know because of those kind of knowledge and those kind of trainings are being import, imported now. So this, this is slowly happening. It will take uh, time. But it is the government alone cannot do it. No, it has to be uh, like something like a PPP, public-private kind of a, uh, initiative has to be there. Uh, and uh, unemployment, you see that no, there are different forms of unemployment. So that the, the, the kind of the mindset of the people. Because no, I'm an engineer, I want to be, but to what extent you are efficient as an engineer? That is also very much important. Yeah. Sir, next question is from uh, Subhashis Misra and is asking, is there any relationship between development and happiness index? <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent, the basic, no, the basic needs has to be there. Otherwise, if the basic needs are not fulfilled naturally, how can you be happy? Number one. And to a certain extent, the happiness also to a certain extent that what kind of a quality of life one, one can have and what is their perceptions about the, the quality of life. So if the quality of life is better to a certain extent, for example, though, like Bhutan was a premier uh, in uh, uh, calculating even the gross national happiness. But the thing is that up late, if you look into very recently, the young people are migrating from Bhutan because they do not have that employment opportunities because no, it has a very restricted uh, kind of an economy. <clears throat> uh, because no, th this is more, more environmental friendly kind of an economy. So, so therefore, with education and all, no, people are shifting 
to the white colored job and they do not have much of a white colored job. Therefore, we'll find that all educated people are migrating to many places like Australia and all. So, so that will be there. The happiness is a, ultimately the management scale. Then to what extent you can be happy and what kind of a quality of life? Because no, yes, it is true that no, if you have more money, if you are very rich, you not necessarily you can be happy. So it is an individual state of mind. But, uh, yeah, but, but at the same time, you'll find that you have to have a minimum of the basic needs to be fulfilled so that no one can be happy. Is it not? So it, it, it will be a certain kind of a standard of living has to be maintained so that you know, that happiness uh, uh, prevails. So the next question is from Kuheli Mukhopadhyay. She is asking, uh, how can the public sector foster localizing development, given the fact that it is not as inclusive and adaptive as it need to be to achieve the sustainable development agenda? How can public sector foster? Foster localizing Lo development. <sighs> so you, you see the localizing uh, means no, why? Always we need to oh, depend on uh, public sector, that is number one. Whether the public sector are efficient. In certain areas, the, there is a necessity for intervention by the public sector. In certain areas, we should not depend on. So, so for example, no, like, uh, say airlines. Uh, previously, it was the public sector, Air India. But 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 at the, at the, at the same time with the, with the globalization and all, all and you no know, Air India has also been privatized and all now today we have only uh, the public sector enterprises in airlines and the, the, the efficiency and efficiency lead to reduction of costs and getting a better uh, kind of a service in the same way it is not necessary that we have to depend on the public sector always, the efficiency is always very much important. You have to create a conditions for that scenario so that the public sector also comes and invest and uh, they develop and ultimately they provide uh, uh, different uh, kind of a multiplayer effect in the economy, in the local economy. So it depends on uh, how we can attract the investment. That's for example, very recently, I can give you that, no, uh, Tata, the northeastern region is very uh, uh, industrially backward. The, and Tatas are going to invest around 27,000 crores in a uh, semiconductor in uh, in uh, in a very uh, backward district in Assa, in a place called Jagiru. So you see that no, that will happen not only that, no, they, that will uh, create employment, but you have to strategize how the local economy, how the local people will be in. So already they will be doing it. Already they have started training the local people so that you know, they can contribute in that process. And naturally it will have a multiplayer effect. So it is not necessary that public sector always has to be there because I think that whether it is a public sector or a private sector, efficiency has to be there. Okay, sir. That's all the questions we had. So, sir, I would like to th th thanks for your sparing your time this morning and uh, on behalf of all the participants and HR, uh, MMTTC MZU, I would like to say thanks and we'll invite you again in some other such programs, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I, I will share this. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think this uh, presentation, maybe already you have recorded. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the paper also I will share it. With you. you can uh, share with the participants. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. I will share. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. Bye. Close.